I'm going to talk about the business aspect of smart contract auditing and not just like the technical aspect, just so that you're kind of aware as you're coming into the space as a developer, kind of what that process is going to look like, because I was getting a lot of questions about that. We will eventually start talking about exploits and bugs and that sort of thing. We're going to do kind of a game show quiz sort of a thing, I guess, where I'm going to show you guys bugs and see if anybody can find them. And then at the end, we'll leave time for Q&A. Um, and I will say that, like, feel free. I want this to be somewhat interactive as well. So feel free to, like, jump in at any moment and stop me and ask a question. Um, I can see that there's chats coming up. I can't see those chats, though, right? So if somebody wants to pause and say, hey, there's a question in chat, then, um, you know, I can stop and answer that question as we go along. So before I get started, I see there are three chats. Were any of those questions? <laughs> They were not. They were reminded okay, us cool. to record. But if the, if there are, we'll yeah. If there are any questions, feel free to jump in yourself. Put them in the chat, and we can relay them to to Jackson. Okay, sounds good. All right, let's get started. Um, I don't know how technical everybody is in the in the in the chat room, and I'm guessing it's varying degrees of uh, technicality. I know most of you guys are senior engineers but that doesn't necessarily translate directly to Web3. So I'm gonna go through some very basic, I, to try and keep the talk as broad as possible, I'm gonna assume folks know nothing or next to nothing. So what's a smart contract audit? Um, I went and looked up a definition from Quill Audits, big long thing, um, but the TLDR is basically, you're gonna author your protocol and before you launch it to mainnet, you're going to send it to a bunch of security professionals and they're going to kind of rip it apart and try and figure out all the ways that they can break it. And they'll send you back a report and say, here's all the ways we were able to break your code. And you can either say, okay, we acknowledge this and we're not going to fix it, or you can fix it. And then usually uh, different firms are different with this, but usually they'll look at your fixes and make sure those you didn't introduce any new vulnerabilities. And uh, then eventually you'll be able to sort of launch your project. Um, the, the, the next question you might ask is like, okay, why do we need these? Because if you're coming from the Web2 space, you're probably familiar with like pen testing and that sort of a thing, right? But there's no like, and the pen testers will even send you a report, but there's no like pre-launch sort of pen test. And that's kind of what a smart contract audit is. So why are we doing this? Um, the first is that it's obviously very easy to lose money. Um, I think probably everybody on this call has heard about all the massive multi-million dollar hacks. Um, if you're not, you can go to the rec leaderboard that I linked to in the slides. There's over a hundred million dollar hacks in the in the top of the rec leaderboard. So it's one of the reasons why we do these smart contracts audit audits is it's very and you'll see this when we go through some of the exploits that I've actually found in audits, how easy it is to introduce critical bugs. Um, another reason why we do it is upgradability is kind of a mess in the EVM. There's a lot of like proxies and there are like libraries to do the proxying, but even the proxies introduce a bunch of bugs and vulnerabilities. Um, this isn't like traditional software engineering where it's like, okay, well, we broke something, your metrics go crazy, your customer was lose a couple million dollars and then you roll it back. Once it's out there, it's out there. And that gets to my last point, which is everything happens on chain at the cadence of a block. And so your entire contract can get drained in the blink of an eye and the snap of a finger. And not only that, but at least before OFAC sanctioned Tornado Cash, you could launder the funds in the same transaction <laughs> that, that your contract got, re got wrecked in. So these are all the reasons why we're doing this dog and pony show of smart contract auditing. Any questions before I go to the next slide? Okay, cool. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through a, a like a choose your own adventure for smart, getting a smart contract audit from a developer's perspective. <laughs> so you finished your protocol. Awesome, right? You've spent months, you've got this new, I don't know, maybe it's a, a 4626 vault uh, that has some new strategy that nobody's ever seen before, right? So you've devised this thing, you've spent months, you've spent months testing it. You think it's the best thing you've ever written. You, there can't possibly any bugs, be any bugs in it. So you got one or two options after this, right? You can just go deploy your smart contract and you're probably gonna lose all your money. <laughs> you're gonna get wrecked somehow. <laughs> um, or what you can do is you can get an audit. You can wait a couple of weeks for the auditors to sort of rip through your code 
pay tens of thousands of dollars for the audit. And you might not get wrecked, but you're probably still going to get wrecked. <laughs> In case you can't tell, the stock is going to be a little bit bleak. So you've decided to get an audit because you saw this talk and you thought it's probably a good idea to get an audit. Um, so you've got a couple of options there. One is you can go to Code Arena, Sherlock, Saloon. These are like sort of security contests where anyone on the globe can sort of sign up for these auditing contests. And you'll have people all over the world looking at your smart contract, trying to break it and submitting their bugs. What happens is you might submit maybe like a $50,000 bounty for your for your contest. And what they'll do is they'll sort of split that bounty, that 50,000 up amongst all the auditors based on the severity of the findings and how many other auditors found those, those same findings. So if it's an easy bug to find, everybody finds it, you're gonna get paid less versus if it's like somewhat of a novel bug. Uh, so that's one option. Another one is Immunify, which would be uh, sort of a bug bounty platform where you, you launch your smart contract. And only if somebody finds something, do they get paid out. And usually it's around 10% of, of, the, of the bug, the total economic damage of the bug. So if you launch your protocol and let's say you've only got a million dollars in TVL, somebody figures out a total way of, a way of totally wrecking that contract, taking all the money, then you'd pay them, uh, what would that be, 100 grand versus if your protocol has a billion dollars in TVL and they, they drain that entire thing, right? That payout's going to be a lot larger. So, so that's one of your options. Um, the problem with these two things is because anybody can submit bugs, there's no, these firms try to do as good as they can in terms of like, you know, making sure that there's a filter in place. But even with the filter, I've heard a lot of de developers say like they're spending way too much of their time sifting through findings on these contests or on Immunify. So you don't want to go that route. You decide to go with the traditional audit route um in this case you have this problem of like how do you find a high quality auditing firm um i get co this question asked a lot from developers because you're kind of in one of two positions you're like i take a risk on an auditing firm i've never heard of before and i don't know what quality their auditors are or i try and get into something like trail of bits or one of these higher quality auditing firms and i'm gonna have to pay 10x and wait months because they've got a massive backlog um, so it's kind of a little bit of a lose lose situation. I feel like for developers, you know, you need to get an audit, but how do you go about doing all this is not an easy question to answer, which is part of the reason why I'm giving this talk. Um, but in all cases, um, see a pattern, you're going to have to, you're going to be paying a lot of money, whether it's on the contest or, uh, directly to the auditing firm. I see uh, there's quite a few, yeah, questions in the chat. On, on that note, Jackson, um, what, so if, if someone was to, to find a 100 million vulnerability, would you, would you still expect them to get 10% of that as a bounty? Um, what's the largest bounty for a white hat hacker that you, you have kind of seen or come across? Um, yeah, I think Immunify has a leaderboard. What is this? <laughs> can't spell. Still can't spell. <laughs> yeah, I got my mic in my, like on the, it's kind of like in front of the keyboard. So it's like messing up. I'm used to home row or whatever, right? So you can see some dudes have made 13 million. Wow. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, th I will say that these bugs are, uh, not easy to find though, because usually if a project is in Immunify, they care a lot about security. And so they've gone through the gamut of like contests, audits, multiple audits, not only that, but it's been sitting up on Immunify. And so everybody in the world knows that there's all these massive payout to be had on Immunify. And so you've got the best hackers in the world kind of looking at your code on Immunify. I feel like the reason why Immunify exists is to incentivize people to not go black hat. So if you're if you find a bug and you're a gray hat hacker, you're gonna go, do I exploit this and take the full 10 million? Or do I report it to them and get a million and not have to deal with any legal legal consequences? Right. So that's primarily why people are why Immunify exists and why hackers are actually submitting bugs to it. Sure. Cheers. Uh, the other questions in the chat were actually about the the content that we create. 
the security content that we create. So unless anyone has any others that they want to shout out, feel free to crack on. Okay, going once, going twice. Okay. Uh, okay, so you decide to go with an auditing firm um, instead of Code Arena because you don't want to sift through all the reports. Uh, so what you'll do is you'll send their code, send them your code and your documentation. This would also go for the contest, right? You're gonna be, it'll, it'll function very much the same way whether you're doing a contest or tr traditional auditing firm. Um, and then you wait a couple of weeks and yeah, either, like I said, you're going to get all these findings from the contest or you're going to get a 20, 20 page audit report from the auditors. <laughs> and in this case, one of two things is going to happen. The report is going to be great. They're going to find a bunch of stuff that you missed. You're going to fix them. Um, you're going to pray that your fixes don't introduce new bugs, which has happened in the past. Uh, if you look on the right leaderboard, you'll see a couple of cases where the auditors found the bug and then the fix that fixed the bug introduced a new bug and that was actually what drained the contract. So you finally launch and you get wrecked or the report is bad. Uh, there's nothing in the report. Um, so you basically wasted your money because the report, the auditors didn't find anything and you don't know if that's because your code's actually safe or because the auditors sucked and you get wrecked. So that's pretty much what it's like to be a smart contract developer. <laughs> I'm obviously being hyperbolic, right? There's plenty of people launching stuff that's totally secure and nobody's getting wrecked. But I just, I, I'm coming from the security perspective, right? So I want to scare you because I've seen many cases of how easy it is to lose all, all the money in the, in the contract. So the next thing I wanted to go through is the auditor's perspective. So what does this look like from my perspective? Um, so I, I work for three different firms. I work for Spearbit, Y Academy, and Oak Security. And I, they kind of just send me contracts every time they get an audit in and I'll be a part of the auditing team that, was, that audits the code. So usually I get it pinged by somebody and they're like, hey, we got this audit coming up, so-and-so date. Uh, could you take this? And I have to make sure I'm not double booked with somebody else or whatever. And I say, yeah, I'll pick this up. Usually there's a code freeze where they say, okay, this is the commit we're gonna be auditing from. But uh, I have a link here to Nomad. Nomad didn't do this. And so that's part of the reason why they got hacked is they they did a code, for, they quote unquote did a code freeze. They, get, they did, the auditors did the audit on that code freeze and they kept developing while the auditors were looking at. So that extra code never got actually audited. Uh, but that's usually what happens is like a code hash is sent to the auditors. Uh, code documentation, we talked about that from the developer's perspective. Usually there's no documentation or the documentation sucks. So please, um, if you're going to be writing smart contracts out in the wild, please make sure you're documenting your stuff, not just for your users, but also for the smart contract auditors. Um, I'll spend anywhere from one to three weeks, maybe sometimes four weeks, depending on the size of the code base, just looking at it. Um, eventually, I'll either meet with the other auditors over the course of the audit or at the end, different firms like to do this different ways because some, some of the auditor, auditing firms have the philosophy that you don't want to bias the other auditors. Um, some of them think that it should be more of a collaborative process. It just depends on the auditing firm. And then we all get together, we create the report, we document our findings and give it to the developers. Um, some of the problems with this is there's always some sort of miscommunication, especially in the case where the auditing firm wants to unbias the auditors. They might totally, there's also, I think, a business incentive to not mingle the developers and the auditors together in like the same chat room, because it would be very easy for if a firm or if a developer wanted an, another audit done, they could sort of bypass the auditors, right? And just, or, or the audit firm go direct to the auditors. So I feel like there's a little bit of churn when the auditing firm acts and behaves in that way. Um, and for that reason, it's some, it means that sometimes the audit, the auditor will like assign a certain severity to a finding when that maybe isn't a valid severity for the finding. Um, and, and maybe the, the auditor doesn't have the full context of how, like, how the smart contract's gonna be used, right? So that might cause some churn around the findings. Um, and then I, I think also, I feel like auditors are incentivized to over-report stuff. Um, which I think leads to a bad experience for the developer because you don't want to sift through 30, 30 findings, especially if they're 
in some cases don't lead to any uh, like loss of funds or anything like that. So one of the things I like to do as an auditor is make sure I'm only reporting on things that are like actually highly critical that actually need to be fixed and generally leave any sort of like opinionated stuff out if I can avoid it. Uh, okay. Oh yeah. Last slide on the whole like business or auditing process end to end is obviously this is broken and it's, I think it's going to improve over time. People are working on ways of improving it. And I think even the contest websites like Code Arena are doing a better job of filtering out the noise um, to try and like cut down on the cognitive burden that the developers are having to deal with in order to um, handle all the bug reports that are coming in. Um, we've okay, had a cool. question come in, Jackson, um, from yeah. Matt. Uh, when you audit, do you rank the vulnerabilities by criticalness? Yeah, every firm has a different way of reporting the bugs, but in general, there's like a critical tier, high tier, medium tier, low tier, uh, gas findings and informational is kind of like, and then they can sometimes like they'll leave out critical and just call it high, but generally that's kind of how things are done. And um, usually the like, you know, higher critical ones are kind of at the top um, yeah. because they obviously get the most attention. And I had a question as well. You mentioned that um, Immunify and Code Arena, they have some problems on, I think, two slides ago. What 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 are the problems with their methods that, that you see? I think next one. This one right here. It was no, I think it was at the bottom of a couple couple further. Next one, maybe. There. You're incentivized to overreport. So is that is that a problem that all auditors face, or is that a specific problem with Immunify and Code Arena? No, I think I think. I think it's very specific to these these places, but I think that it's a problem for auditor. Like, if you look at it from an auditor's perspective, they want you to feel like you're getting your money's worth and that they're doing a good job or whatever, and that they're thorough. And so they want to put everything they can possibly think to put in the report, mm -hmm. which I think it leads to a, a degradation. But I mean, that's all of this is subjective, right? Everything I'm even talking about putting in the slides is. You could find 10 people, 10 other auditors that would disagree with me on a lot of this stuff, right? Yeah. And so it could be said that like we should put every single thing we possibly can think in the report. I just don't do that because I think if I was a developer, it would annoy me. Got it. Okay. Cheers. And and Ashen's asked a, a question. Um, do you use or which framework do you use for auditing? Would it, when they say framework, are they talking like a test testing framework or are they asking about like mental model? Asan, are you available to jump in and clarify that? No, <laughs> no testing framework in the chat. Oh, yeah. I so if you follow me on Twitter, which you should, because I'm a very entertaining tweeter. <laughs> See, your founders are even agreeing with me. I can vouch for that. <laughs> it is very entertaining. There's a, a few fantastic. <laughs> A lot of shit posts, just shit posting. Just <laughs> it's so funny. So yeah, I went on a rant this weekend. Usually I shit post the most on the weekend because that's when I'm auditing and I'm not at my day job at Robinhood. Um, yeah, I had a ship series of shit posts that people got really angry at me about, about Foundry. Um, I I personally don't see any reason why anybody should be using anything other than Foundry for their tests right now. Um but when I'm auditing, and so the reason I feel so opinionated about, about this and the reason I'm shit posting about it is when I'm auditing, I have to use whatever you're using for your test framework because it's a lot easier for me to, like, I don't have to write everything from the ground. Like, so, okay, we'll get into some findings in this next section, but I'm, and I'm not going to like go through like how to write a POC and how to actually confirm that these are actually findings and bugs. But usually what happens is I find something or I think that I found something and I have to confirm it in my in my own way. Usually what I do is I write a unit test. And in the unit test, if I can, if I can say, okay, Alice, this address Alice started with zero ether or whatever tokens, USDC, whatever you're you've got in your smart contracts, and it ended the transaction with more ether or tokens or whatever than it started with, then obviously there's something wrong with your smart contract, right? 
the reason I write these POCs is it's it's like they're they're irrefutable. You can't the developer can't argue with whether or not this is a bug or not if it's fa in fact drains your entire contract. This is the beauty of of the blockchain is that I can I can do this. I can fork the chain, write a POC, and prove that your shit doesn't work the way you think it does or whatever. Right. The problem with this though is like if you write your your tests in hard hat, I have to write the POC in hard hat. Otherwise, I'm like re doing your entire test framework just so I can test this one small, this, the bug might only exist in like two lines of code. And so I'm going to have to do redo all this. Lately, I've been getting so angry about hard hat and Foundry has a way of, of just like injecting Foundry directly into a hard hat project that I do just rewrite the entire test because I'm like, I don't want to deal with hard hat anymore. <laughs> so I'm trying to get everybody to move to hard hat or to Foundry because it makes a smart contract auditor's life a lot easier. In my opinion, you should be making smart contract auditors lives as easy as possible so that they're able to sort of protect you. So I know that was a ranty, long-winded way of answering your question, but I prefer Foundry, like no question. It's 10X better than anything else out there right now. Um, we currently use hard hat, but, you know, clip just know, know. V2 is around the corner. So, uh, you know, if we see an incentive, we'll, we'll be uh, definitely reviewing. Um, uh, one, one question. What happens in terms of volume of audits versus a crypto bull run versus a low? Because obviously, like when crypto activity is down, there'll be less valuable smart contracts to hack. You're spending less on audits, probably, and therefore you've got more opportunity to hack those smart contracts. But then in a bull run, you have more activity, more valuable smart contracts, but probably more audits. So they're probably harder to, to find bugs in, but bigger payoffs like have you uh, they balance out almost what does it look like in terms of activity of of, of orders over the cycle yeah that's a good question so uh, yeah i think i retweeted joran honig he's one of the he's a chat at consensus diligence who's i think he might even be on the immunify leaderboard what's interesting about the immunify leaderboard is if they're all anonymous names and so you don't know who's who but i'm pretty sure he's up there he had, he tweeted is like a week or so ago that he had found a critical in a project, but the TVL was going down as he was waiting for them to say like, okay, this is a, so it started maybe as like a $10 million TVL project. So he's going to make a million dollars. And then by the time the bug actually gets like confirmed by them, they might only be a, a mil, 1 million TVL and he only gets paid on hundred grand. I was like, damn, even the bear market's even affecting smart contract hackers. But yeah, it's, it's, it definitely ebbs and flows. Like, I'm, I mean, almost anything in this space with, with bull and bear markets um, is another problem is like, I had a lot of people coming to me who are like students or, or junior auditors or whatever. And they had like, what happened is like crazy bull market. Everybody saw what the auditors were making. There was an endless amount of work. And so everybody came racing in. Then we hit a bear market and a lot of those folks, it's been harder for them to get hired because the firms are having less less audits, less work available, and so what they're doing is they're they're hot, they're up leveling the bar for people to come in. Whereas like back when I was doing it, it was like, can you fog a mirror? Like, great, we just need somebody to look at this code. We don't care how good you are, whatever, right? So that's a little bit unfortunate. What I would say is like bull market, it was insane. I was like constantly getting fed stuff, constantly getting pinged to do audits or whatever. Uh, there was a lull. In like the summer when like things were at their absolute bottom on the bear market and then it's sort of now at this moment in time it's kind of in between the two where i'm still i still have an audit every single week but it's not quite as like fast paced as it was before the the volume isn't as high i guess as it was before if that makes sense yeah that makes sense um so we just had a um a question would you recommend a resource with hands-on learning on auditing i mean Jackson, you've got your own course around auditing. <laughs> It'd be a nice uh, inroad. Yeah, I can drop a link to that in the chat or or whatever, or in your guys' Discord or whatever. I think you guys are having office hours after this, so can I can drop, grab, give you guys a link when I before I switch over to my meeting after this. No um, yeah. So I, what I have is I put together like a roadmap. It's not really even like a course. It's like a markdown document that's like do these steps and you'll be good enough to be working at an auditing firm. And then it's got a list of all the auditing firms that are hiring. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, because I I kind of went through the the reason I authored the document is I there was nothing like that when I was joining, and so I had to go sift through and find all these resources, and then like sometimes you'll find a resource that sucks, and you'll have like wasted hours reading through it. So I, I had a founder of an auditing firm. He had purchased the document and he just started his auditing firm like last week. And I was like giving him kudos and twi on Twitter and he retweeted. And I think what he said was kind of insightful about the document is that it takes you from guessing whether or not you're doing the right thing to like having confirmation that, you know, like these are the resources that this guy used to get into auditing. So I know that they're high quality resources and they will get me where I need to go. There was nothing like that out there when I, when I joined. Um, so that's sort of why I was, another thing is I've, I've got a YouTube, a couple of YouTube videos where I basically have like live streamed the audits I was doing. I didn't fully live stream them because you're really sitting in front of your computer for like 10 hours a day <laughs> when you're doing an audit. Uh, so what I did is I sort of edited those down into like only the places where I actually had something interesting to talk about in the, in the YouTube video. So you can, I can link to both of those things. Um, a lot of them are CTFs though, like that are in my Gumroad document. So they're actual, like, I think somebody, when I first dialed in, said they had just start, start, started Ethernaut. Ethernaut is one of the many resources in that document. So it's one example of, like, getting hands-on. I think Damn Vulnerable DeFi is probably the best one, in my opinion, because you're actually writing the, the unit test, the POCs I was talking about earlier. You're actually doing that on actual contracts. Cheers. Any other questions? I see there's, like, more numbers popping up. <laughs> Um, what's your YouTube channel? Yeah, any information on Doc's YouTube channel? I think Twitter, we can probably oh, post. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we'll pass on through and we'll put those in the chat um, as we go. We have had a couple of people ask if the presentation can be shared uh, post call, Jackson, if you're happy to. Are you talking about the slides or the recording? The slides. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The recording. Yeah, yeah. Cheers. Um, okay, one more question. <laughs> How is smart contract uh, auditing different from blockchain network aud auditing, or do you do both? You say blockchain network auditing, and you're talking about like the consensus pro protocol and that sort of stuff. Um, Baba, are you able to add some context there? Yes, he said yes. So, yeah, I mean, they're fundamentally different things. Um, but basically, I mean, you can audit any code, right? At the end of the day and try and find bugs in it and report the bugs. Um, what I will say though, is that there's way more volume in terms of uh, smart contract work, which is part of the reason why I'm doing it. Uh, there, it's way easier for people to author smart contract stuff than it is for them to design a brand new uh, consensus mechanism, for example, right? But some of the firms I work with do, no kidding, like, okay, somebody has like forked Geth and they're doing some novel thing with, with some uh, Ethereum fork or something at the consensus layer and we'll do audits for that as well. It's just much rarer. Cool. Thank you. Well, that was a, a good flurry of questions, but we'll let you uh, get on Continue. with the presentation. Cool. So now we're going to do some actual bugs. Um, I'm going to give some hints because, again, I don't know where everybody's at in terms of their skill level before we get started. I'm going to give you guys a fighting chance, basically. <laughs> I thought about just saying, now nah, we're going to dive right into the bugs. Good luck, everybody. But uh, and these are actually like very, very good hints. So we'll put it that way. So what sort of bugs can occur in, in smart contract auditing or really any sort of code logic bugs, right? These are like happen in whether you're writing smart contracts or not. Uh, off by one access control, missing access control, all this other stuff. The, the difference is if you have an off by one in a smart contract, that might be enough to steal all the money in it. <laughs> Whereas if you have an off by one in traditional software engineering, you might lose some data or you might corrupt some data or, you know, you might cause some weird customer impact, right? So that sort of illustrates the heightened sense of security in smart contract auditing versus traditional software engineering. Uh, there's reentrancy. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because it's kind of like, at this point, it's been a 
dead horse beaten to death many, many times. Um, but the only reason I'm mentioning it is it still happens. I still have findings that are reentrancy findings, which proves that people still don't fundamentally understand this concept. Um, there's Oracle manipulation. Um, actually, let me click through to this one because I think Oracle manipulation is kind of interesting. Um, it's more advanced, I guess I would say. Uh, actually, you guys, we had this in the, the docs, so hopefully people are familiar with or Oracle manipulation. Yeah, actually, I'm going to not go into that. I'm assuming you guys know that already um, from, the, from the training you guys have been doing. Uh, there's signature replays or signature malleabilities. And then this is just one small snippet of hints that I'm giving you. There's an endless number of bugs that are available to you as an auditor to find in, in the code. So what we're going to do next is I'm going to share this screen and we're gonna go through some bugs that I've found in an actual audit. We're gonna start out with simplest and we're gonna go up to hardest and I'm gonna quiz a little bit. <laughs> I'm gonna see if anybody can get them. And if, uh, if not, I'll give the answer out. So let's start with this one. Uh, so this is a smart contract that is supposed to hold the implementation for a proxy. So the idea here is that this is like the upgradable upgradability thing I was talking about earlier, right? Which is makes you know, or it it uh, illustrates the, the need for for a smart contract audit, right? Because upgradability is so hard. So what these guys were trying to do here is this is a common pattern, right? Where you have like, okay, you're going to put your contract behind a proxy. You're going to do delegate calls from the proxy into the library contract or the implementation contract. Um, the way the beacon works is it allows you to kind of update the address of the implementation contract. So it makes it easier for you to change implementations in and out behind the proxy. Uh, so can anybody find the bug in this contract? I'm watching the chat number to see if it goes up. This one's an easy one. This is the easiest one. So if you can't get this one, we're gonna be in it. We're gonna be in world of hurt for the next 20 minutes. Here we go. Here comes Vince coming in hot with no access control on the upgrade two. Yep. You can see it here in the in the requirements of the comment. Message off sender should be the owner of the contract. It doesn't check for message sender should be the owner of the contract anywhere in the code. This is critical, obviously, right? <laughs> you can update the you can update the implementation to whatever you want, and that um, that upgrade could be oh. send all the tokens to Jackson's address. <laughs> cool. I see more chats. Are, are there questions? Jordan also replied correctly about the required statement. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, nice one, Slobodan. Okay, uh, next one. This was actually my first audit. It was on a trial audit. And so I wasn't they, I wasn't sure if I was actually going to get the job or not. And I found this bug along with the founder of the auditing firm. So that's how I landed the job. There's a bug here. What is it? I, I guess I could give some background on the, of the contracts too, although it's not relevant. Um, this was an ERC-20 token that was, it was like a quote unquote security ERC-20 token. So it could adhere to uh, security compliance laws or whatever, right? Uh, but it's not Rafa that important for this particular function. Rafael is saying in this case, zero address could be a bug. Uh, Slobodan says checks, effects, interactions violated, question mark. Correct. Oh. Question mark validated. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so this is this is a reentrancy, right? They're canceling this the swap status at the end. And so you can do anything you want in between here because the swap never gets canceled inside the cancel cell call. And you can see that there's transfers going on in here, right? So you can drain the contract. This is what I was saying. Reentrancy. Everybody's like, oh, reentrancy. Heard that a million times. And yet we still see stuff like this. <laughs> 
Interesting. See what I was saying about how easy it is to introduce a critical vulnerability. Literally all the last, the last one missed a modifier. This one introduced a re-entering Z and both of those contracts would have gotten absolutely wrecked had they not had an audit. It, yeah, it shows just the necessity for real diligence and quality when you're writing smart contracts. Tiny, seemingly tiny mistakes can lead to, to massive, massive problems. Yeah, let's put it this way. There's a reason why I don't want to be writing smart contracts myself. <laughs> like the, the worst part of being a security person is that you get to act like, oh, you're an idiot for introducing this bug or whatever, right? But it's like, I am also a, a developer myself. So I know how easy it is to introduce bugs, right? It's not, what these people are doing is not easy at all. Yeah. Okay, next one, unless there are questions. Uh, there, there don't seem to be any questions at the moment. We're ready for the next. Okay, let me. This one might be. This one is probably easier. So let's look at this one. This one was very interesting. Um, it was, and I, in fact, I missed this bug. One of the bugs. There's two bugs here, but I actually missed this one. And luckily, the developer caught it before we went to production. So, and this was the first time I ever missed a critical vulnerability. I felt like. Very sad. <laughs> so this was an interesting contract. It was a, it was a, so if you're familiar at all with Uniswap B3, the way that they do liquidity management in Uniswap B3 is, is through like this NFT mechanism. Whereas back in the old days with Uniswap B2, it was, it was these liquidity pairs where they were sort of overriding the ERC20 functionality to return you back an LP token. So this project was trying to put some sort of abstraction around Uniswap v3 liquidity management so that you could still use the old Uniswap v2 interface and have that manage the NFT aspect of the Uniswap v3 liquidity. And so what they're doing here is they're depositing, they're, they have this depositing, this deposit external function that acts like an ERC20 or whatever LP token. And it eventually deposits the liquidity into the Uniswap v3 pool, but it does a bunch of counting here, like making sure that the shares get minted properly to the user that is deposited into to manage the, the NFT liquidity for Uniswap v3. So if we look at the add liquidity function, what it does is it, the token, uh, the, the, the shim, the wrapper over the Uniswap v3 protocol has a, uh, its own pool. And that pool is a, this pool variable is actually the Uniswap v3 pool that they're depositing the the liquidity into. So if you're at all familiar with Uniswap v3, I wasn't familiar with Uniswap v3 at the time when I audited this. I learned about v3 kind of through the audit, which is another good reason to become a smart contract auditor. It has this mint functionality. And the way it works is Uniswap, you have to have a callback in your in your the function that's depositing the liquidity because Uniswap will make a callback into your your it's like almost like a flash loan, right? You make the flash loan call, there's a callback that comes back and says, okay, here's your tokens, just make sure you're paying them back to us at the end of the transaction. It's very similar here to how they deposit liquidity. And so you, you, what you do is you, you uh, interface with this periphery payments smart contract that Uniswap V3 provides. So the call here is like, you've got this bunny hub thing. It's got a dependency on liquidity management. Liquidity management is the contract that actually deposits into the Uniswap v3 pool. It that has a and it inherits this callback function here for periphery payments. So if we go in here and look at, oh, I didn't remove my comments. <laughs> Don't look at those. Those are the <laughs> audit comments. <laughs> I've never done this one in a talk before, so this is the first time I'm I'm doing this one. Part of the reason why I wanted to add it is it shows how hard it is to because you have to go look at all the dependencies. It's not enough to just like look at the smart contract that you're auditing directly. Um, okay, so there's there's two two bugs in this this contract. Well, let's start with these. We, we have we'll one comment. The bugs that I missed. We yeah, have one comment that the loops usually occur at the point of calling a payable function. Are you talking about up here? Not entirely sure. Ephraim, are you are you there to to make a case? It might have been earlier. That was a couple of minutes ago. 
Oh, yeah. In this case, it's not a DDoS. If I think that's sort of what they're suggesting. Hey, okay. I I'm feeling like Slobodan's working away trying to figure it out. Same with Vince and Raphael. Are we going to get there? Do we have an answer? I need to stump you guys at least once. Oh, Someone saying it's too complex for a newbie. Well, you've done great so far. We're relying <laughs> on you. <for> that. <laughs> this one's actually easy. It's as easy as the first one. God, don't say that, Jackson. <laughs> we'll get to the one that I missed. That one's somewhat harder. All right, I'll give it another because we're looks like we got 12 minutes left. I don't Moses is saying, time. hold on. I can <laughs> his brain whirring away. No pressure, Moses. <laughs> right. Require should come first. Question mark. It's close. I mean, you're all along the right track. There should be a required statement somewhere. Cool. Can't be the ac same access control. It could be. It could be. Okay. Anybody can call these functions and transfer whatever balances in these contracts to themselves. Line 23 says Moses. 23. Yeah, 22 or whatever, 36, they need modifiers or a required statement of some kind. Okay. And that's the answer, is it? For these ones, we're going to get to the harder one here in a second. Cool. Okay. There and then there's where is it? Ah, um, oh, I may have to skip this one. Shoot, where is the actual? Oh, right here. This is has the Uniswap V3 callback, right? So I was saying it's similar to the flash loan. There's a callback that come, that happens. I missed this one. So if you guys find it, you deserve my job. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a lucrative career ahead of you. Which I don't know, you guys are doing really good. So clearly there's some skilled people here in this this chat, which is great. Yeah. Where the, the chat has gone quiet, I think a lot of concentration. <laughs> And I guess we could maybe even skip some of these other findings and go right to QA after this. I can, I'll just briefly go over the other ones just to say like these are also bugs. That'd be great. Ah, Fabio's entered. Hello, Fabio. Hi, guys. We, um, we're just looking at this contract and trying to figure out what's gone wrong here. Where's the bug? No pressure, Fabio. <laughs> I understood. Guys, I'm not technical, but this is very interesting. <laughs> All right, I'll give it away. So it seems like. I think that's the best. <clears throat> so the problem here is like you can pass in, you're assuming that the caller is going to be the Uniswap pool, right? And so you think, okay, the message I'll sender has to be this Uniswap decoded pool variable. But anybody could pass anything for that value without having it be part of the callback. We're getting some ahs in the chat. Ooh, <laughs> it's clicking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can encode your address in the payload. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So well, I don't feel so bad for missing it. You guys all missed it too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, quickly, I'll go through one more uh, or th these last two. I won't give them, I won't pause and like let everybody go through them, but these ones were uh, signature malleabilities uh, right here. This is where they're checking the actual signatures for like minting some NFTs or whatever. And in this case, they don't include a nonce or anything like that. And so basically, what happens is anybody can reuse the signatures that are involved. Um, these are harder ones that I was sort of building up to, but I, I think we're running out of time. This one was a really interesting project. It was a sushi swap project 
where they were trying to do the, the back running of a, of a sandwich, sandwich attack. So the idea is that you encode half of the sandwich attack in the DEX itself so that MEV searchers can't do the full, they can only do the front run, they can't do the back run half of it because you're taking it, you're doing the back run yourself. Um, let's see if I can, oh, stupid thing. Back. Oh, my bookmarks aren't showing up. Let's see if I can find it real quick. So this, the idea is that they would take a flash loan in order to do the back running half of the, of the swap. And the bug here, it's not actually not critical, but I, I think we marked it as a medium, but it's still a very interesting bug. So I wanted to add it anyway. The somewhere deep nested in these calls after the flash loan comes back and the, the contract is doing whatever it wants with the capital. There's cases where you might make a swap to, let's say you want to do the back running on Uniswap or something like this, right? That, that swap might fail for some reason. And in that case, it would revert the entire swap. So if somebody comes to Sushi Swap and says, I want to do this back running DEX thing, they're expecting that their trade should still go through, right? Even if the back run fails, you still should let the person trade. And in this case, the whole thing would revert and there would be no swap, <laughs> um, which is obviously a bad user experience. And then where's the other bug in here? It's right here. So this one's kind of an interesting one too, where uh, they have the swap and stake function. So if you have ever played around with any of the DEXs or the liquidity pools or anything like that, often what you're doing is you're saying, let's say I have a bunch of Ethereum or WETH or something and I wanna supply liquidity for USDC, right? So often what you'll do is you'll take the WETH, you'll swap it into USDC, and then you'll take those as a pair, submit those as create a liquidity pair out of them and then submit it to a pool or something like this, right? So they're doing all this in one function for you. All you have to do is say, take this, this WETH token and I wanna create this amount of li the liquidity pool token and it'll handle the swapping and staking and all that stuff for you. The problem here is this value right here, this divide two. This divide two, uh, is, the, is the problem. If you're at all familiar with how the carry invariant is maintained inside of these DEXs, it's not always a, a direct div, div two, right? So if you take, let's say 100 WETH, you're not always going to take ha exactly half of that in order to create the pair. And so what happens is you leave a small amount of dust. I call it dust because it depends on how big the trade is that's happening in the DEX. There's always going to be a small amount of dust kind of left over inside of this contract as a consequence of the fact that they're, they're doing a div, div two here. The fix is there's a bunch of math and we like have a have a, a blog post write up in the in the report and everything like that. It's like there's like a Babylonian square root is actually how you come to the right number. Um, but the what? How did you do that? <laughs> I didn't know you could do that on Zoom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This div two is the problem. Uh, anyway, okay. That, those are all the findings. Uh, I guess I'll go back to the slides now. Vince is saying that it reminds yeah. me of people hard coding uh, USDT to $1 and getting wrecked. Sometimes some of these yeah. assumptions. Yep, 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 exactly. It's very similar to that bug actually. And in fact, in that case, I brought this bug up to the developer and they were like, that's not a problem. And so we had to go, like I said, we had to go find a blog post that proves all the math that like, Div two doesn't work, and oh. eventually they fixed it. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you for that, Jackson. That was brilliant. Yeah. I mean, from from someone who doesn't know how to code, I was still fascinated by that. So, yeah, that's why I did it the way I did. Is I was like, even non technical people should be able to follow follow along. Yeah, I'm glad yeah. you enjoyed it. Absolutely. And well, we'll open up the room for for some questions. We've got five or six minutes to go or no five minutes to go um so do people have any questions for jackson jackson i Don't have a question to follow me on twitter yeah go ahead <laughs> jackson uh so there are a lot of ai tools that are also coming up for auditing so you do, do you think those tools will become better than humans in auditing smart contracts if and when? talking about chat G, chat G, gpt sorry example? Yeah, you're talking about Chat GPT, for example. Yeah, Chat GPT as well as a lot of people are creating tools uh, for, uh, I think, materials. There's, there's some tool like that. So those tools will they be able to do it better than humans? 
Yeah, I, my my opinion on this, and again, it's it's an opinion. I'm sure if you pulled ten auditors off the street, everyone would have a different opinion. Um, my opinion is that it will be a little bit like Slither, like maybe a more powerful tool than Slither. And in most cases, Slither is like not that good, right? It's going to give you a bunch of false positives, and presumably, if it doesn't give you false positives, in the majority of the cases, the developer already knows about Slither, and so they've already ran it, right? And I think the same thing's going to happen with these tools. Is like maybe the develop if they become ubiquitous enough, and they are good, they're not there yet, right? I don't think any. I think everybody agrees that they're just not there yet, but they might be in like a year or two. Who knows? The developers are going to know about it, so they're going to run it through these tools or whatever. In my opinion, and I, this is often what I tell people, I think the difference between a junior auditor and a senior auditor is that the senior auditors are looking at the game theory and the dependency contract. This this open MEV, that, that last open MEV bug I showed you guys about the swap div two or whatever, right? I don't think an AI is ever gonna be able to find something like that because you have to have all this background knowledge around what protocol are they interacting with and what is the K invariant of the DEX for that particular protocol, right? That's not That's nowhere in the code. So the AI would have to sort of like, and I don't, maybe it'll be able to do this. I don't know. But the AI would sort of have to go, okay, I'm going to read through this contract. I'm going to have to somehow infer that this, this thing is going to be de deployed with Uniswap as the deployed address to do the background against. Okay, now I need to go look at the Uniswap code to say, what is their K invariant? Does this still hold if it's a div two? And from what I know about computer science, I don't. I, that feels like an intractable problem to me. But every day, another AI comes out that's blowing everybody's mind, and so I very well could be in five years be like. And my opinion is like, if that is the case, that AI, be, I, I mean, I like auditing, but if I didn't have to do it, I would be totally okay with that. <laughs> so if there was some sort of AI that was like able to just like find all the bugs, that would be great. Is it the case, Jackson, where like you know? chat gbt is trained on like you know just just absolute just trillions of data in terms of anything before 2021 anything after that it's not being trained on that kind of data so within the language like ethereum or solidity that's evolving so quickly all the time don't you have to have some sort of ai which is always keeping up to date with that could that be also a difficulty you know because chat gbt right now will be looking at a, an older version of solidity different bugs as opposed to now. Yeah, chat chat GPT is a little bit, in my opinion, like a straw man for the for the for the bear case argument against AI being able to do this because it is a general LLM, right? And so um I think I think the if I was gonna steel man the argument that AI can do all this stuff, I would say somebody's gonna go train something that's constantly mounted. It's very specific to let's say Ethereum, and all it knows is Ethereum, and it knows Ethereum better than anybody else. In which case, it would be monitoring all that stuff. It would be training itself on every new Solidity update. It would be mo constantly mon monitoring the blockchain. It would be able to immediately analyze the dependency decks and understand. And it might even be able to go further because it can go into the bytecode or it can. It's almost like the MEV stuff, right? Some of the, like, I don't know if you guys saw recently, there was an MEV bot that went back 50 blocks to front run the hacker. That's mind blowing to me that an MEV bot can do that, right? And so there are, there are people already doing shit like this out there in the mempool. So if you take that and combine it with AI or something like that, I, I mean, I could see it, right? I think, um, Slobodan, did you have a question? You turned your video on. Uh, just yeah, yeah, I did have a question. Sorry. Um, uh, thanks, Jackson. It was an awesome presentation. So uh, earlier during the presentation, somebody asked about tool, what tools you use, and then you asked if you if they were referring to your mental model or to the actual like software tools. So I was interested more about your mental model, especially how how can you sit straight ten hours and just looking at this <laughs> road, especially not not as readable as, for example, like I don't know some other programming languages uh yeah and then and then um also since you're not writing code yourself how, how do you do this how, where where does the capacity come from mental capacity <laughs> yeah good these are great questions uh so this is one thing i put on that youtube video because i got this question a lot it was like how do i go about doing this and so what i do is i basically not only am i like doing the audit and like i had edited it down but i also am talking about 
my mental model and like my approach to how I go about breaking down a project when it first comes to me. What I usually do is, and every auditor is different, right? If you follow some of the better auditors out there, they all have a different approach to me. Like I saw Trust recently was saying something about he'll read the docs first or something like that. And I usually don't look at the docs that closely because I'm like, I, I look at them to go in at my head, I'm reading the docs and I'm thinking that seems very complicated. So make sure that when I get to that part of code, make sure it's either doing what they're saying that it's doing in the documentation or that there's not some weird edge case that they haven't considered. But I don't really like make a habit of like really focusing hard hard at the docs. I will read those first though. Usually what I do is I, I treat the contract like a dependency graph and I actually start, it's like a, a depth first search in reverse kind of. So I go to the very nodes of the dependency graph where like in this case of that uh, bunny contract that we went through, where I was saying there's like a third order dependency involved. I'll look at the dependency first because usually those those contracts are very small and they're self-contained and the, and they, I don't need to have any other extra baggage, mental baggage when I'm looking at those. So I'll start with that and then I'll sort of go, okay, where is this function being used? Is it being used anywhere in the code that I'm actually looking at? And then I'll, I'll move my way deeper and deeper, kind of like an onion, right? I'm peeling back all the layers until when I'm in the center, I have all this background knowledge of all the dependencies and the center is usually where all the funds are, right? Or all the math related to the accounting is or whatever, right? And so by that point in time, I have all this background knowledge and background context from slowly whittling my way into the middle. Um, and then another thing I do is I put, I'll go through the contracts twice. Uh, the first time I'm just dropping comments and they might be like totally bullshit off base comments that don't make any sense. But if there's even like a hint of like a code smell, I'll drop a comment and say, this smells bad come back to it later and like spend a lot more time on it. So I do two two passes through the contracts from start to finish. The first pass is just like high level, understand all the pieces, understand the dependencies, understand the other protocols that are involved, and then uh, drop these comments. And then what I'll do is I'll come back and either I'll have like looked at another piece of code after I drop that other comment and I'll go, oh, I know this is fine now, or oh, I know this isn't a problem anymore. I'll just mark that comment is done so I don't come back to it again. Or if I'm if I'm still curious about that comment, even after having made the first pass, that's when I get out Foundry and I start writing POCs and start like playing around with variables and stuff like that, right? So I'll put a lot of console statements everywhere. I'll start playing around with variables in the dependencies or in the unit tests or whatever, right? Just trying to tweak all, pass all these edge cases into the contract and see like, is there ever a case, like I said, where my unit test spits out that there's more money? And if that's the case, then I've found something. Yeah. Nice. That was great. Um, Jackson, I don't know whether you need to jump off, but we do have a few more questions. If not. I do have to jump, but I'll, I'll answer the questions because I like doing these talks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll give them in one. So Matt was asking, have you been called into audit a contract that is already in the wild? And are there like special types of things that you need to do to res resolve those vulnerabilities because they are out in the wild? Um, Moses asked, have any of the contracts that you've audited eventually been wrecked? I would hope not. Um, and then a bunch of really positive comments about your, your talk. Um, final one, do you make a checklist when aud auditing? I don't make a checklist, but I know other auditors do make a checklist. I think we might even have one in Y Academy, but I don't know if it's public or not. That's one thing I guess I could check after we get off this call and see if the Y Academy checklist is available publicly. Uh, and then we can dump that as well. Uh, actually, one of the guys I audit with at Oak, he's like, I think top 10 on Code Arena. He, had, he recently uploaded like a heuristics uh, repo or something like that. So I can at least send that if nothing else. Um, Cool. The other question was about wrecked. Uh, so no, I, I so far nothing's that I've audited has been wrecked, um, but I did miss that critical. I think I mentioned before, um, which yeah. was really sad. I, that ruined my day. <laughs> and now after I audit, now that I've audited audit stuff, it stresses me out. I, it didn't stress me before because I was like, oh, I'm just doing my best, whatever. Right now, I know like the ramifications of having missed something, and I'm I'm like. I never want that feeling ever to happen to me again. There mm -hmm. was one more question. What was the other one? Um, the the other question was from Matt. And are you ever called to call into audit a contract that is already oh. in the wild? 
Yeah, sometimes uh, Y Academy will get your own strategies that are already have already been pushed to production. Um, I was just recently auditing Rage Trade. I didn't I didn't actually get to finish the audit because I got pulled into like a ZK related thing instead. But the Rage Trade stuff was in production. Uh, I think Rage Trade is actually in the middle of doing an upgrade, and so whatever founding findings we had as a part of that got. I think got added to their upgrade or something like that. But yeah, it's it's usually relatively relatively rare that um, auditing something is already in production, but it does happen. Cool. Well, I think the the overwhelming feedback is this has been incredibly useful and yeah, entertaining too. So Jackson, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, welcome to jump in the Slack community anytime you want. I'm sure there's going to be a bunch more questions. Um, we will share the recording just in our community. And if you could share the, the slides with us, that'd be fantastic as there's quite a few people um, asking us for that. Um, yeah, absolutely. A note to everyone else is that we are running our office hour session for the next 50 minutes. So if you're if you're kind of stuck, have any challenges, please feel free to, to jump onto that call and we'll be there to help you out. Um, any final words, Jackson? Don't get wrecked. Don't get wrecked. So wise. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much, Jackson. This was brilliant. Uh, and thanks everyone for attending. Um, look forward to you on the, on the next one on Tuesday. Cool. Indeed. See you guys. Cheers. All the best. Bye-bye. We'll post the Zoom link in the other chat, um, in the chat now for anyone.